The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for this pandemic to finally be over and behind us. I cannot wait to feel safe to gather for worship again. Not just because I long to see those who have had to make choices about their health over in-person gathering, not just because I long to be able to sing again, which is such an important part of my faith and I'm sure yours. One of the biggest reasons I cannot wait for this pandemic to be over for us is to be able to get back to normal in-person worship gatherings because in our congregation, we have five baby dedications that we need to do. Five children that are part of the life of our community of faith that have not been blessed in the ways that we normally would. Now, we know that they are blessed by God. There's no question about that. We've all been praying for them already. But baby dedications are not just for the babies. They're for the parents to make public promises about how they will raise their child in accordance with the desires of God so that the child can have every benefit to them and come to know of God's love for them. And not to be overlooked, they're for the church as well to remind us of all of our responsibilities to support the families among us, especially the younger generations that are being raised right before our eyes. Baby dedications are some of my favorite moments in worship. They're always special. They're frankly, spiritually profound. They tie us right to the traditions of Jesus and the Holy Family. Everyone's happy when you have a baby dedication. Many cry tears of joy, new babies, Infants along with their older siblings who've never been dedicated. Big brothers and sisters who just want to tag along when I walk the child around the congregation and speak words of introduction and affirmation because they're just so proud to be there with their younger sibling. It doesn't matter what else has happened in worship. When there is a dedication, it seems as though everything becomes clear for us. We're centered again on the type of faith Christ told us to have, the responsibility of sharing our faith with others and of being the presence of Christ for anyone in our midst. If there's a baby dedication in the order of worship, you just know it's going to be a good day. Mary and Joseph knew that it was time to introduce Jesus to their faith community, as was the Jewish custom. 
as the firstborn male, he was to be designated as holy to the Lord. So they made the trek to the temple in Jerusalem, prepared to go through all of the customary rites and rituals. He'd been circumcised on the eighth day already, as was required by the law, and it was time for the ritual of purification for him for them all. They were prepared to make the required sacrifice for someone of their lower economic status as well. Others who had more might have been able to offer a larger sacrifice, a goat perhaps. Two young pigeons were all that was required of them. In Luke's mind, at least, it was likely all they could afford. He wants to be sure that we understand the place Jesus, Mary, and Joseph occupied in their culture's economic hierarchy. As scholar Shively Smith says, the poor were not merely a cause Jesus championed. The location experience of the poor was Jesus' experience from his very infancy. And there was another man in the temple named Simeon who had received a vision from the Holy Spirit that he needed to be in the temple that day. Luke says that he was a righteous and devout man. He was looking forward to a time when all of Israel would be reunited and restored. In fact, he had been told that he would not experience death before the Lord's Messiah arrived. It was a day Simeon longed for, as anyone would, and anyone who understands the context would understand why. The people suffered under the tyrannical rule of Herod. Even without Herod, the Romans still appeared to have ultimate control over them all. A privileged few in their culture shared in the finer things of life, but the vast majority of people struggled to survive. The religious elites compromised their faith to make deals with those in power, and they got caught up in the corruption and found themselves more focused on controlling the culture than on serving God. And time and time again, Simeon came to the temple to pray that God would intervene in all of this. Perhaps he saw them as they moved up to the steps of the court of the women, the, the farthest place into the temple that the mother would have been able to go. We aren't told if he observed the proper protocol most parents would require today. Likely not. Did he ask permission before he took the child from his mother's arms? Was he too excited by the reality of what he was experiencing to stop and think it all through? We aren't told exactly what happened, but we know that even Mary and Joseph, who had received angels as messengers heralding the news about this child, and shepherds who came to bow down before the manger in which he, they laid their child on the night that he was born, even Mary and Joseph were amazed at what took place. All we know is that Simeon was waiting for a sign that God was with God's people. He was waiting for a sign that God was still at work. And here it was. Here at last was the one he had waited for. And he just couldn't contain himself. He began to worship. And that's how it is when you experience a clear sense of God's presence, isn't it? You can't help but worship. You can't stay silent. You have to sing and dance and pray and give thanks. And you have to tell anyone who will listen exactly what has taken place. With the child in his arms and the mother and father looking on, Simeon began to praise God and to sing. That was a strange song to be sure. He sang of his own death and that now, because he had seen the Messiah of God, he could not only die, but he could die in peace he would be able to let go of his concerns for this world, knowing that it was all going to be okay. Because he was confident that God was with him. God was keeping God's promises. God's love and care for this world had never waned. Simeon wasn't the only one who recognized what was going on either. A woman named Anna had spent most of her life in the temple, worshiping, praying, fasting, and serving. When she saw the child, she too started to worship. She praised and gave thanks to God, and she began speaking of the importance of this child to anyone who would listen to her. Both Simeon and Anna had waited for a long time for a sign that God was at work, and when they finally got it, they began to worship. What I find interesting about these two very strange interactions with the Holy Family the child who would grow up to be the savior of the world and his parents, trying to figure out all that is going on, is that what changes most immediately is not their context, but their perspective. 
Simeon, in particular, has been waiting for a sign from God that someone will finally put all of the mess that he sees in the world back into proper order. It doesn't happen immediately, though. The next day, Herod and Augustus will still rule. The plight of those who struggle under oppression will still be the same. There will be those who will reject what he sees in the Christ child, and it will cause inner turmoil for many. But Simeon is at peace, just knowing that God is at work. I inherited the wedding ceremony that I use most often from my father, who's a minister. It opens with a line that says that the people everywhere and in all times have gathered in times of sorrow and in times of great joy. I found myself using that same line at many of the funerals that I have preached as well. Times of sorrow and times of joy. And somehow life often contains both at the same time. Life is full of ups and downs, glory and anguish, beauty and sorrow, gladness and opposition. There is so much in the experience of life that we have to celebrate, and yet there is still so much that brings us heartache, pain. But God has promised to be with us through it all. That is the message that we continue to celebrate just less than a week after Christmas. That is the reason we need Christmas to last for as long as it can. That is the message we need to not simply persist in the new year, but to keep us strong throughout the entire year as well. We need to know that God is with us through it all, and that should give us peace to face whatever the coming year brings to us. Theologian David Lowe's calls this Christmas courage. It's the type of courage, he says, that enables us to endure the tough times of life because we have seen signs of God at work. It enables us to stay the faithful course, to keep working for God, to keep doing ministry and missions as we're called to, to keep worshiping and serving our neighbors as a sign of God's love for them. Sometimes the signs we need come when we are all alone and through something we read or experience, we receive a message that clearly tells us that we aren't alone or at least not as alone as we think we are. Sometimes they come when God works through the people in our lives who offer us the comforting presence, the ear to listen, the shoulder to cry on, or the hand to lift us up exactly when we need it. And even when those signs don't come, we remember the celebrations we have each year at Christmas, and we keep on singing the hymns and carols right along with Simeon to remind ourselves that in Jesus, God is still with us, even when we don't always feel it. We still have faith that it is true. You have probably heard, like I have, stories of women and men who come to the end of their life, but they seem to linger on forever. It just seems like they cannot let go. Finally, someone may realize that they are waiting for something, it seems. They may be waiting to see a loved one. They may be waiting for something to be finished or accomplished. And oftentimes, it seems like the family has to finally give the person permission to go, to ensure them that the ones that they love will be okay and will be cared for. And only when they are released from the duty of caring for their family will they finally welcome the mercy of God. It seems strange that both Simeon and Anna seem to feel as though they can finally move on once they have seen Christ. It is as if they've been working for so long and so hard to keep everyone around them true to the desires of God that they are completely relieved when they are given the opportunity to rest, to retire, to welcome the blessings of God that come to the faithful at the end of their life. They were like so many diligent servants who refuse to give up the work until they know that it is placed in someone else's good hands. Like a captain at the wheel of a ship, they are ever faithful until the watch is over and they are relieved. And when they see Jesus, they feel relieved and they celebrate. This is the type of diligent faith we have had the opportunity to celebrate at so many of the funerals that we have done in my tenure at our congregation, our church. The grief is always real, but the person's service to God's kingdom has been so clear that writing and preaching the funeral is frankly pretty easy. It makes it a true celebration of life. All you have to do is tell their story and let their life shine through. Just don't get in the way of it. 
simply talk about their faith. The way it came through in the work they did to make earth look more like the kingdom of heaven. When thinking about these services, I found myself so many times going to the parable of the landowner that Jesus would eventually tell when he was grown. He talks about a man who leaves all of his possessions in the hands of his servants while he goes away. The ones who recognize that this is an investment in them turn around and invest that money that he's entrusted to them in ways that further the, the wealth of the landowner. When he returns, he's incredibly pleased by those who have worked for a great return on the investment. He praises them and says the words remembered by so many, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in little and I will make you faithful in much. Enter into the joy of your master. On this day, we not only remember the dedication of Christ to the temple, but we also call to mind each of those people in our lives who have been the Simeons and Annas for us. They have been the ones of unwavering faith, willing to stay true to their task no matter what, until they are at last given release. They have seen everything that is good and full of potential in themselves as something that God has invested in them. They know that God has intended it to be used for the good of the world and to be invested in furthering in God's kingdom. They are merely stewards of it. So they work and serve and support and love and teach and lead until at last Christ welcomes them home. And that is the faith and life to which we should all aspire. It takes a willingness to trust the promises of God seen in Christ just as Simeon and Hannah did. It takes a willingness to recognize everything that you have as something God has entrusted you with. It isn't yours alone. It is meant to be used for the good of God's kingdom. And so you generous with everything you have so that others around you will be blessed. It takes a willingness to show up for the world in ways that enable you to be the presence of Christ in exactly the ways that the world needs. This is the first Sunday of Christmas. So we continue to sing the praises that Christ is Emmanuel. God is with us. Still, there are times when our world knows that God is out there, but they feel like they need more than a spiritual presence. As someone once said, they need someone with skin on. And that is why Christ gives us his spirit, so that we can show up in the world on his behalf, so that we can see, the world can see him in us. We come as representatives of Emmanuel. We come as the body of Christ so that the rest of the world will be able to see clearly that God is with us because we are with them too. Simeon and Anna have a faith we should all pray to have. They listen and follow when God gives them instruction. Even when they had labored long and hard, they stayed the course, believing that at some point God would be true to God's promises. They have eyes to see the presence of God in ways that others might not. And when they recognize it, they cannot help but shout it out and sing God's praises. And their faith in God fuels them to work and to work and to work for God's kingdom until they have a clear sense that their time is accomplished and it is someone else's turn to carry on the mission and ministry. They are the very definition of the good and faithful servants. And I pray that when our time comes, we too will be able to say that we are as faithful and as blessed as they were. Amen.